I remember I first met you back at a conference in 2013. It was the St. Louis FinCon, I think. And we were both talking about fire at the time, but it seems like it was so long ago that we were talking about fire probably shortly after the cavemen discovered the other version of fire. <laughs> Hi there, I'm Mindy Jensen. And I'm Carl Jensen. And this is the Mindy and Carl on Money podcast, where we talk about what happens after you reach financial independence. Why do we call this show Mindy on Money? Because the Financial Independence podcast was already taken conveniently by today's guest. Well, that's such a great segue. We are interviewing none other than the mad scientist today on the show. But first... I want to tell you that this show is sponsored by us. Us? Our our scholarship? Is that what we're talking about? Our scholarship fund, to be exact. That's right, Carl. This episode of the Mindy and Carl on Money podcast is sponsored by the Mindy and Carl on Money Scholarship Fund. On today's episode, you'll hear Brandon share that he wants to give more. But finding a charity that you really like or that you feel is legit can be kind of difficult. I do have to disclose that the Mindy on Money Scholarship Fund, I'm sorry, sweetheart, the Mindy and Carl on Money Scholarship Fund is not a 501c3 contribution organization, whatever. There's a lot of hoops that you have to jump through in order to get that particular designation. However, we can't even spend the money that we have. I can guarantee you that every dollar raised goes back into the community, and specifically sending people to in-person FI events. So if you'd like to learn more, either to apply to receive the scholarship or to donate so that we can send even more people to in-person FI events, go to mindyonmoney.com slash scholarship. So today on Mindy. So today on Mindy. No, I thought that would be funny. So today on Mindy, and then you go and Mindy. And Mindy or Ann Carl? And, and I go Ann Carl? I don't know how that would work. Now I'm confused. We didn't plan for this introduction. Yeah, clearly. <laughs> okay, so t- say it again. Say today on Mindy. So today on Mindy. And Carl. On Money. We talked to Brad and the Mad Scientist, one of the legends of the financial independence community. We're going to talk about what he's been up to. Brandon has been, been a little bit elusive. He hasn't been doing many podcasts or blog posts. I don't think he's published anything in a long, long time. We're going to talk about how his attitudes towards spending have changed since he talked to Ramit. We're going to talk a little bit about our experiences too. And finally, we're going to delve into how we can all use money to increase our happiness a little bit at the end. This might not be the answer you expect, but I love this topic and I'm curious to hear what y'all think about it. Let's get into it. Three, two, one. Wow. So, Brandon, we've known each other for like 10 years. I remember I first met you back at a conference in 2013. It was the St. Louis FinCon, I think. And we were both talking about fire at the time, but it seems like it was so long ago that we were talking about fire probably shortly after the cavemen discovered the other version of fire. (laughs) It feels like that, definitely. Yeah. Yeah, Yeah, That was my first FinCon. That was the first time I ever like actually started treating my blog seriously because I was in the hallway. I remember it and I met Jay Money from Budgets Are Sexy and he actually had seen my site before and that was enough to like make me take it far more seriously because up until that point I was like, what am I doing? I'm just like typing. I don't think anybody's reading it because I didn't even tell my family or friends. So like literally nobody was reading it, maybe Jill. And then, yeah, that was the first time I was like, whoa, somebody is actually reading it and it's somebody cool like Jay Money, which is amazing. Yeah. To have Jay Money read your blog is like to have him say, hey, I know who you are is super awesome. Um, Oh, it was amazing. But for you to say that you weren't even taking it seriously, like now I quote your blog regularly, (laughs) um, the how to access early retirement funds and the Roth conversion ladder. And there's a couple, like as soon as I start typing in my Google, it pops up mad scientist, like whatever it is that I'm looking for, because you have a couple of really powerful articles that are like the bedrock of nobody even does articles on that particular subject because you've done it better and there's no improving. So that's well, funny thanks. that you're like, oh, I wasn't doing it anymore. <laughs> well, yeah, at the time I didn't know, 
yeah, if anybody was reading it or it would ever see it. So uh, it's amazing to be, yeah, what, 10 years after that. And I'm still, I'm still riding on that and those past successes and not really doing too much, but yeah, still here I am somehow. <laughs> <laughs> so your evolution is pretty interesting. As you just alluded to, you're not doing a whole lot with the blog or the podcast anymore. What have you been doing? Yeah. So yeah. Not doing too much. Um, cause I, I, I just, I just tend to do stuff when I f get an interest in something or I really, or realize that there's something that I haven't talked about that as now I'm realizing is super important. So I actually do have a podcast episode coming out fairly soon, but that's my first one this year and could be my last one this year. Who knows? It's only the stuff that I think <laughs> is, is important to talk about or something that I haven't addressed yet. So yeah, what am I doing now? Two things, all these synthesizers behind me, using a lot of my time to make really weird electronic punk music, I guess is the best way to describe it. And I also have a 20 month old son now. So both of those things take up a lot of the time more more the latter than the former but yeah so that's that and and we also bought a house in scotland so redecorating it and like building the studio and stuff has been the third thing that i've been doing so so yeah those three things take up most of the time and then yeah squeeze in some blog and post podcast stuff anytime there's something that i think needs to be said or talked about uh, i think that's cool and there's something to be said for that because you're not sticking around and forcing yourself to make content that you're not passionate about. You're doing what you're really passionate about, the music, and maybe the blog stuff and podcasts were great at one time, but you've moved on. Unlike maybe us, maybe we're still stuck in this space, but we still we still enjoy it, so it's all good. And, and You we guys have stuff free. to talk about, which is good. I just feel like, yeah, I, unless I'm super interested in it, I just can't talk about it or especially I can't research and write about it because that's just like torture. So I have to be like super, super excited about it or really into it to, to overcome my laziness because my, my inherent laziness is just a very tough hurdle to get over. So I have to be really passionate about it to actually do the work to get it out. So it's, there's yeah, fewer and farther between for actual topics and subject matter these days. But when I do publish, I'm really excited about it and I'm super happy to have an audience to interact with when I do. So I'm, I'm still very grateful that the Mad Scientist exists, but yeah, just a lot less stuff these days. Well, I think that's a really important point. If you're not really passionate about it, it's just another article. And we've all read articles where like, wow, this author really phoned it in. This is not teaching me anything. I'm not learning anything. And you did put in a ton of work beforehand. It's not like you were lazy the whole time. Although I say that, and I know that you were never like, I got to publish every Monday and I have to post a blog every Monday and I have to, you know, release these podcasts on a set basis. I think it just makes it more powerful when you do talk because I, to anybody who hasn't heard of the mad scientist, I will tell them he takes, he delights in taking these complex financial topics and then he understands them and disseminates the information in easy to understand ways, which is so important because I do not understand the tax code. And <laughs> I don't know, it's almost like you read it for fun. <laughs> no, definitely don't read it for fun. <laughs> read it to make my journey to FI as quick as possible. So yeah, I was completely selfish. So yeah, over the years, people have asked like, why don't you have a 529 article and stuff? And because at that time I didn't have kids and now I do have a kids, but I realized that the portfolio is probably going to grow faster and higher than I expected or anticipated. So saving, saving a little bit of money on taxes for a 529 plan still doesn't interest me. So that's why that article still doesn't exist. So yeah, so it, it was, it was never out of love. It was out of like a determination to get to FI as quickly as possible. And every article or podcast I did was completely selfish in the sense that I wanted to help myself get there as quickly as possible. So <laughs> Ooh, and that is a great segue to what we're going to mainly talk about today. You're talking about, you just mentioned getting to FI as soon as possible. And that was kind of our modus operandi, the way we decided to approach it was, which wasn't necessarily the right way to do it. One of your funny stories is drinking water in the bathroom. I think of the restaurant in Switzerland because you didn't want to pay for the bottled water. We have oh, a similar God. story. This was actually at the New Orleans FinCon, which we met you where we sat on a bus for 90 minutes, like a city bus, because we didn't want to pay for an Uber. 
Like, all these people are there waiting to interact and we're on a bus, which <laughs> so, I, I yeah. feel like we've come a long way and we're different people now. Oh, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Thankfully, I feel like I've come a long way and yeah, that you guys obviously have as well, but still a long way to go too, because old habits die hard, which I think we're going to talk a lot about today. Yeah. Old habits do die hard and we're trying, we are trying to break through our old habits that we don't like. There are old habits that we like. If you like your habit, don't change it. But there are some things that we don't like. And frankly, we were inspired by your conversation with Ramit Sethi last February, February 2023, where you talked to him about breaking through some of these silly financial habits that you were kind of stuck in, mainly being cheap. And I'm not saying that as a, well, it is a kind of a negative, but we're also <laughs> cheap. I'm not calling you out yeah. and being like, wow, you're cheap, Brandon. Why aren't you just more yeah. spendy? We're not sticking even... your face under a spigot in a restaurant in Switzerland. The fancy fondue restaurant in Switzerland is, uh, I would say it was probably pretty cheap. So I, I'll take it. It was a different time though. It was a different time with <laughs> our money. So I'm curious, your conversation with Ramit, we listened to it and he had tried to maybe inspire some spending experiments. And I think one of the things was spending a little bit more on coffee. And we can talk a little bit more about that if you want to. Do you have any general thoughts on the Ramit episode? Did it change anything you thought about? or Because I have a thought on this, but I want to hear what you have to say first. Big time. Yeah, no, it, it changed a lot. And that, that's why I wanted to get him on the show because I knew that was still an issue I had because, you know, I trust the math. I'm good at it. And I know how compounding works. And even though it's hard to grasp the enormity of that, I, I could understand that, you know, the way I was spending and earning still meant that, you know, I needed to increase my spending or figure out how I was going to give the money away or figure out what I was going to do with it. Um, so that's why I asked Ramit because he he always likes to poke fire people, which I, I think is hilarious, and I, I don't get upset about it because he's he's right most of the most of the things he says is right. So I got him on the show to give me some tough love and I'm sure to sort of put me in my place and show me where I was ridiculous in ways that I could be not really not as ridiculous. So it's been hugely impactful. So. So yeah, my conversation with Ramit, but then also um, reading a book called Die with, Die with Zero, which was also really influential over the last couple of years and making me realize that money now is sometimes a lot more valuable than money later. So the example that I have in my head is because this is a very real example for me. Like I always thought, you know, I'm building up more money because uh, I have unexpected income coming in. And I was like, all right, well, you know, we'll buy this amazing ski property in 10 years or something. So we'll save up for 10 years and buy this amazing mountain house, either as a primary home or a second home, who knows. And then we can live this amazing skiing pond hockey lifestyle that I always dreamed about as a boy. And now that we have our own little boy, we can bring him up in the, in the dream world that I always wished I had when I was growing up because I was obsessed with snow, obsessed with hockey, obsessed, obsessed with skiing. So, but then when I read Die With Zero, it's like, yeah, that could be great, but maybe you should be spending, you know, 10% of that money now and having these amazing ski holidays with your son when he's two and you're 42. So your knees are a lot better shape than they're going to be when they're in 52. And maybe you're not going to be super excited about being in, you know, negative 20 degree weather and coming down a mountain when you're 50 in your mid fifties or low early fifties, then, and you're going to love doing that now in your early forties. So it's about, yeah, sure, you could save that money and it's going to grow to whatever, double at least by then. And you could have double the fun technically then because you could spend double the amount on wherever you stay and wherever you ski. But maybe it's more important to do that now because you're going to enjoy it more. And then you have these memory dividends, which is something he talks about in the book where you get to have that memory for the next 10 years. And that's, that, that has real returns. Uh, it's a, it's a beautiful dividend to, to be able to look back at photos and realize that you spent some really fun times teaching my son who's two to almost going to be two this winter, how to ski and things like that. So those two things, very impactful. And yeah, Ramit's episode kicked it off because he really pushed me to start spending more but not spending more like just like double the amount of time you eat out or double the amount of trips you take but more like thinking of another level and 
using money to maybe, maybe you don't want to double the trips, which I don't because we have a toddler, but making those trips better is a, maybe a better use of money. So he made me rethink of things like, I always just thought spending more to meant doing the thing more, but yeah, he, he sort of made me like, no, you can spend more to make certain aspects better and really push me in that way. So I feel like I've made a ton of progress over the last couple of years, but yeah, there's still a long, long way to go. Cause yeah, as I said before, old habits really die hard. They really do. And as a mom of someone who is slightly older than two, I can tell you that when they hit 12, they're not that interested in spending time with you on the slopes. They want to go <laughs> hang with their friends. So right. having the experiences now, teaching them how to ski, skiing with them now is going to be so much more rewarding than in 10 years starting. Plus when they're two and they're, Oh my God, those little skis. We just went snowboarding the other day and like they're, the kids are just, they learn better when they're two. Oh Take yeah. Them now. Just those little stars. They're just like skiing down like this. They just look like a little star going down. Yeah. So, so yeah, no, it's, it's been hugely influential and I'm so, so glad I'm starting to yeah focus more on this side of things. Cause it's, it's really fun. It's like, yeah, it's, I was listening to one of your other podcasts. I think it was the, the one where you talk about the backlash from Ramit, your Ramit episode. And I was listening to that and it was talking about how hard it is on the flip side if you're a spender trying to switch to a frugal person and yeah i can't even imagine how hard that is because this is already difficult doing this but this is like the fun way this is like oh what's your biggest dreams let's just spend money on it like a maniac and that's like a lot of people's dream and so it seems so crazy to talk about <laughs> it as a problem because it is such a great problem to have but it does take it does take effort and focus because yeah we're so used to the frugal the frugal lifestyle so ingrained that we do need to focus on it but yeah it's a, it is a good problem to have and it has has been super fun as i've got more comfortable with doing it so that's really interesting that you brought up the comments what was your response what did what did people say about your episode because Technically, Ramit was on your show, but towards the end, he was kind of grilling you. And mm -hmm. when he was on my other podcast, Bigger Pockets Money, he was grilling me at kind of relentlessly. And I started crying. And there was this overwhelming support for Mindy. Ramit is so mean kind of comments that I, I kept getting in the you know, emailed, emailed to me. And I was like, well, I, I thank you for sticking up for me, but also he's not wrong. He's just maybe not delivering me this message on a silver platter filled with puppies and unicorns to play with <laughs> while he's telling me you need to get out there and do your thing. Yeah. Yeah. No, the, the feedback was good. Actually. That, that is what I brought him on for. I was hoping he would grill me and use me as like a punching bag because one, he had my first interview with him. I, he's been on twice. The first interview had never, he had never done an interview on a fire podcast or anything. So I wanted him to use me as the punching bag. Cause I've seen him on Twitter, like just brutalizing some like fire Reddit comments and things. So I wanted to him to use me as the punching bag. And then the second time I brought him on, it was more specific to like actually help me so yeah, the comments were fine. Yeah, a lot of people push back on some of the spending stuff because again, we're all naturally frugal people, especially Matt Feintis readers and listeners. So there was some of that, but but no, I think maybe since I didn't cry, nobody was really defending me too bad, too much. <laughs> but had I cried, they they would have probably stuck up for me. But no, I was a, I was I was a willing uh, punching bag in both in both scenarios. But he did, yeah. The second interview, he did definitely made me sweat because he just kept pushing, which I, I know you guys experienced that when you were on his show. So he, yeah, he, he definitely pushed me past my comfort zone, even though I was expecting to be a punching bag. Our goal is to try to make you cry here. It might not be because of that, just because of the, the poor quality of the questions I ask you, and you'll be questioning why you ever agreed to do this. No, no, no. I, I want to back up a second. Something really profound and unexpected came out, at least for me, talking to Ramit. And I don't know if I've ever put it in these words. So this might be the first time Mindy is hearing this as well. So we went on there and Ramit's telling us, oh, yeah, you should spend money. You should do all these experiences. So I'm like, yeah, you're right. We absolutely should. 
So what I started doing, Brandon, is thinking about like, how could I spend this money to improve both our experiences, like when we go on a vacation, uh, what we do with our kids, but also our daily life. And the thing that came out of it, the daily life part, which I think is the most important because I don't live on a vacation. I don't live on a Hawaiian island, although that would be kind of nice. The most profound thing I took out of it is an appreciation for my daily life because I'm trying to think, how could we add money? Like, <laughs> should we buy a different house? Should we have different cars? And like, no, everything is really great. I can't throw any more money at making my daily life better, but I think I need Ramit to tell me to go try it, to spend the money, to see what you could do. So now I think I have, we definitely have loosened the purse strings for vacations. We went on a helicopter ride. I saw Taylor Swift, all this fancy stuff. But what I've come to realize is my daily life is really good. And I'm so thankful for that. I don't actually have to spend any more money on that. Uh, I disagree. I think that we have loosened the purse strings in our daily life. We definitely have started going out to dinner more when we've had a, a rough day or, you know, we're still remodeling a house. And if we have pushed through the Why whole Why are you still day, remodeling a house? Why are you still remodeling a house? Thanks I thought for that was, <laughs> yeah, I thought that was, I, oh, I watched your episode. That's, I know exactly what he was pushing at. So are you guys still hanging doors and painting and? No, we hired that out. Um, okay, but okay. Painting, yeah. There's like there's a lot of little bitsy painting jobs that are like paint the the spine of the door, you know, just little bitsy stuff that to get somebody out here would be more work, so expensive, <laughs> and more work. But also, it's really hard to find contractors. So sure. But why are you doing another house? What, what, no, no, this, no. This uh, is the same house. We're just okay, like, okay, okay. Wrapping it up. Um, okay, cool. But Carl bought a Tesla. There, so, so yeah, we need to stop there because every so before, so when I got Ramit on, my one goal was like, I still have work to do. If Carl doesn't have a Tesla, then I need to keep bringing Ramit on. If he's listening to the podcast, which I know he was, because Mindy would email me and say that you guys listened. So that was my goal. I was like, I can't stop this line of thought until Carl buys a Tesla because the fact that you didn't have one, but were so obsessed with the company and made so much money off of Tesla stock over the years and just so obsessed with EVs in general made, made it, made me realize how much work there was to do in the fire community if you haven't had one. So I was thrilled to hear that you finally got one and. I would love to hear how you like it. If it was it worth the wait or is it just a car at the end of the day? Yeah. Sorry to flip the tables, but I haven't talked to you about your Tesla yet. So I'm glad you brought it up. No, this is such a great question. I do not regret buying it, but it's not an epiphany either in the, <clears throat> excuse me, in the end, it's uh, an appliance for life. It's a way to get somewhere a little bit better and a little bit more enjoyably. It makes road trips a lot more fun. So I don't regret buying it, but it doesn't really make me happy. And I don't think it ever would make me happy. One of the reasons I bought it, Brandon, was I wanted to track the process of their FSD software. So it is good. We take it on road trips. I just saw Pete with it in Arizona. I went to Las Vegas. Seems like Mindy really wants to throw me under the Tesla right now. <laughs> yes, I do want to throw you under the Tesla right now. I'm glad he bought it so he would stop talking about buying a Tesla. <laughs> <laughs> That's but true. now I talk about driving it. Mini really loves the the full self driving software, which doesn't do so hot in Longmont now. I think the next version is going to be where it's at, though. I'm going to drive it tomorrow with a friend. Actually, I always think the next, or you always think the next version is going to be great. Um, <laughs> when it comes down to it, for me, it's just another car, and I like my favorite feature of the car is that I can get into the car and it moves the seat forward. So oh, to nice. all of my presets. So Carl and I have a height difference that requires us to have different seat positions and we share all of our cars. So every time I get in the seats all the way back and I have to move it all the way forward. But now with Tesla it does it for me. So uh, That's thanks good. Elon for that particular <laughs> feature. So I've got oh, one more thing to say about this whole Tesla thing, Brandon, someone else was mm -hmm. asking me about this and I said, I would be happiest if I didn't have to own this thing at all because I was thinking about our time in Edinburgh and it was so nice just to walk everywhere and I'd much rather walk than be stuck in a metal cage. So that would be my ideal life. I think the Tesla in that 
way is a necessary evil. It makes, if you have to be in a car, it makes it a, a little bit more pleasant, but man, I'd just rather not have any car at all. And we're in Arizona. They had those Waymo robot cars everywhere. Just relying oh, on nice. that when you have to, and just walking and carrying your bags of groceries in the shopping bag. That That's how I would love to live. If I could. I'm right there with you. That's my, that's my dream too. The autonomous car and you just yeah, hail it if you need it, but otherwise just walk around. I agree that uh, that's the ideal. But anyway, I'm glad you got it in that that now I don't have to work as hard on this side of things. I just have to work through my issues and I don't have to keep worrying about you because, yeah, I'm glad you I'm glad you finally pulled the plug. So congrats. I would like to point out that when we were in Edinburgh, it was like the best weather ever that Edinburgh has ever had. I actually got a sunburn because nobody brings (laughs) sunblock to Edinburgh. And Carl was in Arizona in February or March. So both of those are pleasant temperature times in I lived in Arizona some of my earliest memories are standing at the curb like hopping from foot to foot because I'm barefoot because I'm a kid but also the sidewalk is so hot you're going to blister your feet if you stand there and I absolutely want to be in a car when I am in when it's August in Arizona and again I want to be in a car in December in Edinburgh yeah that's true yeah yeah, or it could be July and it could be awful in Edinburgh too. So it's, yeah, December is particularly bad because it's dark, but it could be 40s and rainy in July. So yeah, cars cars in Scotland are definitely more useful than probably even yeah, Longmont. You guys get a ton of sun in Longmont, but yeah, definitely Arizona. Um, but yeah, hopefully autonomous Ubers are, are around the corner and then, yeah, nobody has to own them. You can just hail them and that, that's my dream. I can't wait. Is there anything you think Ramit gets wrong or he got wrong about you, us, or the financial independence community? Like you alluded to before, you know, we're, we're a frequent target and maybe rightfully so of his, uh, of his angst, of his philosophy. So what do you think he gets wrong, if anything? See, I don't, I, I wouldn't be able to say anything at the moment because there's been so many times over the past, because I've been following Ramit for quite a while just on Twitter because I think he's super funny, charismatic guy, really smart. And yeah, so I've been following him for a while and there's been so many times where I think, all right, he's just, he's wrong. He knows he's wrong. He's just doing this to poke the bear and get a reaction. But then like three years later, I'll start to see his side of it. <laughs> And it's happened a lot. It happened after the first time he came on my show. He said a lot of things that I didn't really agree with. But then as I like marinated on them and tried to like put some of the stuff he suggested into practice, I realized actually he's right. And it's complicated for him, I think, or for the audience, because when he's saying stuff to people like us, he is right. But it's also a bit... I don't know, dangerous to say that to the broader public because a lot of people aren't like this, us and spending comes a lot easier. And so, so yeah, so some of the stuff he says, I probably wouldn't say, but I wouldn't, I haven't come across anything that I'm like, okay, you're definitely wrong about that yet because one, I don't want to jump to c- conclusions because like I said, so many times in the past, I thought he was wrong. And only after years of uh, thinking about it and working on it that I realized actually he was right there and I can see his point of view. So, so yeah, I'm not going to, I'm not going to say he's wrong in any, in any way, but maybe his advice that he's targeting the fire people about maybe doesn't apply to the general population. So. Yeah. I think that it's not so much he's wrong is that I'm not ready to hear it yet. <clears throat> well, that's it. Exactly. So I've, I'm, I'm slowly, getting into a position where I'm ready to hear it and it's making sense. And as I work through some of the things, I'm like, yeah, that does make a lot of sense. And he is right. So yeah, so that's why I wouldn't, I wouldn't be able to paint any of what he says is wrong because maybe I'm just not ready to understand it in the way he's delivering it yet. Cool. We'll talk about this a little bit more in a moment, but one of the things I've done is Regarding spending, it still feels uncomfortable, but I force myself to do it, like getting out of your comfort zone, which feels a little bit to say with spending money. But I'm like, let's just buy the concert tickets or let's just buy this helicopter thing. I, I rented a silly car too, and it it hurts a little bit to press the submit button after you've put your credit card in there to do these things. But most of them have worked out. And if they haven't, that's good too, because it's an experiment. And now I know I don't have to do that thing again. So back to you for a second, Brandon, you mentioned that you've done some things like taking your kid to ski. Have you changed anything else as a result of the conversation? 
Oh yeah, definitely. So on, on the episode with Ramit where, where he was on my podcast, he pushed me to like 10. So he was talking about like, what do you love? And I was like, well, one thing I love during my daily life is just like making my coffee in the morning, my pour over coffee. I get the best beans. I'm already spending like, like the most money you can spend on beans and getting the best beans from around the UK delivered to my door. And I have a really nice grinder that I bought that I, I love and love using every day. And that was worth the extra money. And he's like, well, how can you 10 X your spending on coffee? And then that, this is when I started getting like really sweaty and uncomfortable. Cause I was like, I'm already spending, like I already bought the nicest gear. That's not like commercial grade, the, the, the nicest, like consumer grade stuff. I've already bought all that. I get the best beans. I'm like, how, like, how do you mean? I can't, I can't even, but he just kept pushing me. He's like, well, how can you 10 X it? So since then, I've tried to 10 exit. I haven't been successful, but it has pushed me further outside my comfort zone and made me get more creative. So some of the ways I've done that, I booked a pour over course in Edinburgh and it was like almost 200 pounds for like two hour course. And I was like, I already know how to do pour over. It's super simple. I've watched like 500 YouTube videos on it. What can they possibly teach me? But I had Ramit's voice in my head, like, well, you have to 10 exit. So this is not even going to 10 exit, but this is going to get you uh, closer to that, that goal. So I bought it and yeah, that was clicking that button was so hard. Cause I was like, this is a complete waste of time and money, but it ended up being an amazing experience. We, I went to a roastery that I now was maybe my favorite roastery in Scotland. I, I paired up with the girl that writes all the descriptions on the bag. So she's the one that says like pomegranate seeds and dark chocolate or whatever the you know the crazy <laughs> words are that you can never really tell <laughs> that it tastes like that but it, you know it makes it more fun so i paired up with her for two hours we we brewed so many coffees we dialed in the pour and she, the, every time we would brew one she would be like this is why this is slightly different and this is how i would change it to make it better and it was incredible it was like i couldn't have got there's no way i could have learned that from youtube because I was tasting the difference. So now when I brew a pour over, I can taste what I need to do to make it better. And it was, it was an incredible experience. So that's one example. And again, had Ramit's voice not embedded in my head, I wouldn't have booked it. I wouldn't have clicked that button because it was a ridiculous button to click. I'm, I'm now I'm to, to, to 10x it even more to try to figure out a way to 10x this whole thing. I, I think I'm going to get into roasting my own coffee. So my buddy in North Carolina started roasting. And I thought that would be a fun thing to just like collaborate with him on just me roasting here. And we would get this, like he bought the same roaster that I'm considering to get it and that I, I think I'm going to get. Um, and it's now hopefully going to be this even more interesting hobby where I'm making Christmas gifts for all my family and friends and things that uh, is home roasted coffee. And I'm going to get to understand that side of it. So Again, with Ramit's voice in my head, I booked a roasting experience at a local roastery and I went for two hours and learned how to roast coffee beans on a, on a commercial roaster. So those things have been great. And if it wasn't such a lofty goal to 10 exit, I wouldn't have done them because like 10 xing it just seems so crazy that anything seemed like it would be a good thing to try because I needed to 10 exit. And I found that actually in my own personal life as well. I've set the goal to spend what the portfolio generates every year using, you know, like a 3.5% withdrawal rate, which is super, super conservative, but I hadn't been doing that because we just have never spent that much in a year. So I've been trying to spend that much and having that goal that's not easily achievable with some little tweaks has then made it so much easier to like you, Carl, rent that fancy car on vacation just to try it. I'm not a car guy, but I was like, maybe I'm missing something. So I rented actually a Tesla Model Y. I rented one of those because I was like, I've never tried it. I've never been in a Tesla, so let's drive one. On this last trip, I had this big giant SUV thing that I wouldn't want to buy, but it was interesting for a few days and things like that. So it's made spend making those button clicks a lot easier because I'm like, there's no way I'm going to hit this target to spend my annual spend target. So I might as well, because when we're at home, like you, Carl, and maybe you, Mindy, a little bit, <laughs> your home life is so dialed in that it's like, I struggle to think what I would, I wouldn't buy a fancier car. I wouldn't buy a different house in my daily life's very cheap because I'm just in here making weird noises on these machines and playing with my son. So now it's like, I know I'm not going to hit it in daily life. So then when I go to the States for a month or something, then I buy, I book that nicer Airbnb or 
the more central Airbnb or the one that I can invite my parents up to or invite friends up to. And it just makes it a lot easier. And then the, those trips have been way more fun. So yeah, we were in the States just last month, booked an amazing place in Stowe, Vermont. And I booked it so that my Boston friends could come up for the weekend. We had a great weekend with them. And then we went to Durham for a week to see some of my North Carolina friends. And I booked a really nice Airbnb right in the center of town. And my mom and stepdad and my grandma came up for the week. And then we had a great week, week with them. So yeah, so the, it, I think I think setting those stretch goals has been really influential because even though I've never hit any of my stretch goals for any, any of my spending stretch goals, I've, I've never hit one of them, but it's pushed me further than would have been easy or comfortable. And it's made me get a little bit more creative. And like you, I don't think there's been anything that I've regretted. I think the only thing <laughs> I bought an Apple watch because I, all my devices are Apple and I love everything Apple. And I was like, well, every time I buy an Apple thing, it makes all my other ones more fun too. So I bought an Apple watch and I still haven't really, it's like, it's okay. It, it was good for skiing and tracking my runs. Um, but besides that, it hasn't been like amazing day to day. So that's like the one thing that I can actually think of that's like, meh, that was okay. But everything else has been super, like in incredibly positive. So yeah, it's been, it's been a lot of fun. So putting on my Ramit hat for a moment, you said that you are talking to your North Carolina friend who is buying the same roaster that you're thinking about buying. Why haven't you bought it yet? <laughs> that's, a, that's a good point. Because we were, one, we were gone for a month and a half. And two, it's good, I don't know where to put it. So that's the issue. So I need power outside of the house and I need space somewhere. So I need to first build a either run power to one of my outdoor sheds that currently exist, or I'll build a new, not build, because I am not like you guys. I will pay somebody to bring it to me and install it or build it or whatever you have to do to make it happen. So yeah, so it's it's more a place to put it because <laughs> Jill's not gonna want a coffee roaster in our kitchen and I can't think of anywhere else that would work. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I was waiting for good weather to figure out where it's gonna go outside the house. Okay, that's valid. And Carl, why don't you just hop on a plane to Edinburgh? We'll get our spending in. Go over there, teach Brandon how to build his build his coffee shed. You, Carl's dad was an electrician, so he can run all the electric for you. Or we could just let Brandon spend it. But you would have so much fun no, I'll just, I'll just visiting do it. with your friend. Yeah, I'll just do it for Brandon. I enjoy it. He doesn't, so I should do it. I, I get a trip to Scotland. That all sounds awesome. I love it. Well, that would be cool. Well, yeah, you guys okay, are more than welcome anytime. One more question. You said you've got the best beans. Have you tried Kopi Luwak? I have not. What is that? Is that the one that they poop That's out? That's the cat poop coffee. Yeah, I have tried it somewhere. I don't know where and I can't, maybe I just, it, it's one of these memories that's so foggy that maybe I just read about it a long time ago and then thought I had it. So I'm going to go with, I'm going to go with no, because I, if I did do it, I can't remember any of the experience, but I would, I would definitely, I would go for it because that sounds just weird and interesting. So it's the, it's the poop part of that whole cat poop coffee thing that really keeps me from trying Kobe Luwak. <laughs> it's not the money, yeah. although I find it almost absurd how much it costs, but the the fact that it goes through the cat's digestive tract is just a little too much for me. I, yeah. I feel that like Brandon yeah. has come a long way as a person. I remember when you were said you were disgusted because Jill put her dirty clothes next to the clean clothes in a suitcase. <laughs> That's so, not money. So no 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 <laughs> hear me out. So so you're disgusted by that, but now you're saying you'd be willing to Drink coffee that comes from a beans that came out of a cat's butt. So, yeah, well, that's great. I, that's great. I have come. I, I still don't like the the dirty clothes touch and the clean clothes. But now that we have a toddler, I think I'm just more accepting of the fact that my life isn't pristine. Like I used to wash my hands before coming in here to touch any of these because I just wanted this place to be like pristine. But now I realize that my life is chaos and my 20 month old son is not going to stand for anything in this house being pristine or clean. So now I just come in here and I don't have to have like surgical clean hands to then touch my synthesizers or anything. I just come in and use them like a normal person, which I think is healthy. I think I'm, I'm getting better in that, that none of none of my old habits were were anything I would recommend or 
uh, suggest to anybody else. It came in handy during the pandemic. I was like, I was like a mile ahead of everyone else when uh, the pandemic kicked off. But nowadays, I think, yeah, going back to normal is better. So I'm, I'm working on that too. That's part, that's part of the thing I'm working on. And to be honest, that was only three days ago that I came in here and didn't, didn't like scrub down before I came in here. So this is a very recent thing, but it, it just makes me more likely to use all this stuff since I don't have to like have conditions be perfect. So congratulations on your filthy habits. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so in your episode with Ramit, one key thing really stood out to me when he started describing fire and specifically FI subreddits, he said, you can look at the top 20 posts right now and you will see people using words like depressed, guilty, anxious, miserable, prison. These are not the healthy words of someone who's being strategic and conscious about their spending. And that's like a direct quote. But those words resonated with me to an extent. Guilt for sure. Anxiety. Carl and I at that time had a lot of anxiety towards our money. But I disagree that it's because of the FIRE movement specifically. I totally agree that it's not healthy. Um, mm -hmm. But I think that our issues stem from childhood experiences. And his comment, these are not the healthy words of someone who's being strategic and conscious about their spending – really hit home. Did you agree with any of that? The guilt, the anxiety, the depression? Did you have any of that going on when you were yeah. starting to, to, to spend? And where do you think that stems from? Yeah, yeah, no, no, definitely. I've, I've probably hit all of those at some point. And where it's where I don't know where it stems from. I think it's just maybe natural humanity. As you as you remove external things that get you down or piss you off or make you sad, then you just find new things. It's just like, it's just being human. I think some days you're just depressed and sad, and sometimes days you're anxious, and some days you feel guilty about things, or some days you feel proud about things. So yeah, I definitely probably have hit all those at certain points. The guilt thing is very hard. It's because it, like I've traveled a lot and. I've seen very poor countries and you just think how, like, how am I so lucky to live in a nice, safe country in a warm house and, and, you know, be able to provide a safe place for my kid to, to sleep and things. And that's overwhelming to me. And I don't know how to think about those things and then still, I don't know, just be content and be happy with life. So, and, and that, that's part of the, like, I haven't got as good at giving to charity yet because the problem seems so overwhelming. So then any amount I give, I feel guilty that it's not enough. And I think that's what's still holding me back. So I, again, I'm just incrementally trying every year to give more and more. So that's, that's my solution to that. And it's like, as long as it's more than last year, that's okay. If it's not a ton, that's okay too. But as long as it's more than that last year, that's uh that's a good, good way to go. But again, that, yeah, that's a very difficult one. Cause yeah, I don't know. They're like, how, how did we get so lucky? Yeah, we made good, de good decisions. Absolutely. And we made choices that other people haven't made. And, or, you know, maybe that's why we're in a slightly better situation, but also a lot of it's luck and a lot of it's upbringing and where we were born and who we were born to and all that sort of stuff. So, so yeah, the guilt one's tough. I don't know how, how to address that other than just being grateful for what we have and I don't know, not being frivolous, but then <laughs> <laughs> that, that sort of counteracts with the, the remit side of things and trying to be a bit more frivolous and it, it, it's just it's a tough balance so that yeah that's a tough one yeah the depression thing it's like when you remove all the external things making you unhappy but you're still slightly unhappy you're like well what's the problem what's what's wrong with me it was easy to blame unhappiness on a job which is why yeah the first few years post fire were a bit more difficult because i i'd blame my job for being a little unhappy and depressed sometimes. But yeah, so uh, the first few years were rough because I'd blame my job on so many things. It was like the reason why I was unhappy, the reason I wasn't pursuing some of my long-term creative goals, all these things. And then first few years post fi I didn't pursue any of my <laughs> any of my creative goals that I thought I was going to do because it's it wasn't my job holding me back. It was the fact that creative stuff's hard because you're putting yourself out there and you're trying to do things that you know, maybe you don't think you can do and you're trying to overcome all your limiting beliefs about yourself and stuff. Um, 
And, but, but when you don't have your job to blame for your unhappiness, then you're like, well, Jesus is tough. So there, there was times, honestly, during, I don't know, maybe the first three years of post fi life where I was like, I sort of wished I didn't take the red pill or whatever the matrix references, whatever pill Neo takes to then realize what the world is. Cause I was like, I saw like my friends who were just living happy lives, like just being around their co colleagues and just doing like the normal nine to five thing. And I was like, man, they're just like happy, just watching sports on the weekends, having a few beers with friends. And, and here I am like striving for this big goal. I achieved it. And now I'm like in a room <laughs> just trying to like struggle through this creative, this creative process. And I'm disconnected from everyone because I don't have colleagues and I don't want to go get colleagues because I know the downside of having annoying work colleagues. And it's like, and I have the a privilege of not needing to do that. So I'm not going to go do that, but you miss out on a lot of the, just like the general interaction. So, so there were times during that first three years that I was like, yeah, I sort of wish I didn't know this path existed. And I was just on the normal path, just doing the normal thing and being content with like having fun with my buddies on the weekends. And, but those are just growing pains, I think. And I feel so happy now, especially with a 20 month old son to have that ability to, to be here and watch him grow up like this. And I know that I do need some social interaction. So even though, yeah, people can be idiots sometimes and make me mad or make me pissed off or sad or whatever. And the thing is that, you know, having interpersonal relationships does, I know it's important. So I'm making more of an effort to go like tomorrow I'm going curling and I'm going to be on the ice curling with a bunch of people. And last week, one of the old ladies said something that ticked me off, but that's okay. <laughs> it's fine. <laughs> I could be a grumpy old man. Cause I'm, I'm mostly there with like, like retirees. So I can, I can embrace my grumpy old man and I can just give it back to her next week. So that's fine. So, so yeah, so it, you just learn things about yourself as you go on, but yeah, there, I, I've, I've probably experienced all those things you mentioned. And, and I think it's just natural being a human, no amount of money or no amount of like ideal lifestyle is going to change the fact that down deep you're a human and you're just going to have crummy days sometimes. And some days you're going to have great days. Ooh, that's a really important point. No amount of money is going to change the fact that life still happens to you. You said something I thought was very interesting. You said frivolous spending. And I think that that can be really limiting. I say this like I don't categorize my frivolous spending as frivolous spending as well. But I think that can be really limiting in your mindset when you are, you're like, well, okay, I've got my my core expenses, housing and food and transportation and like all the things you really can't do much about. I mean, there's house hacking and we're not going to get into all of that, but these are your core expenses. And then there's the fun expenses, but you're categorizing them as frivolous expenses. Have you ever thought about reframing the frivolous to fun or some other word that makes it okay? Because frivolous in this context, well, in, in almost every context, is a negative word. It's a negative connotation. Uh, absolutely. And that was my old habits dying hard because R Ramit would have crushed me for that because I'm a they're not up. frivolous. If they're, yeah, you should. Yeah, I need, <laughs> I need another session. Yeah, no, I agree. I completely agree. That was a, that was a slip from my old days because, like I said, I'm trying to just hit what my portfolio could generate. So I'm not... I'm not spending all our income. I'm not spending income plus portfolio, what it could generate. It, it's like just trying to hit my fine number of spending what my portfolio could generate. So it's not frivolous and it's not, it's probably less than the majority of Americans spend every year. So it's, so you're, you're absolutely right. I shouldn't have used that word. I should have, yeah, framed it as fun split. So even in my spreadsheet, which again, <laughs> I'm trying to limit my spreadsheeting because it's not as important, but I, <laughs> I struggled to let go completely, which I want to talk to you about yours, Mindy, because yours was un, unreal. I hope yours isn't still as detailed as the one you sent me is, but yeah, so in my, in my spreadsheet, I have a splurge fund, which since I'm still earning unexpected income, I was like, well, I might as well like enjoy that rather than just throwing it on the pile. So I'm trying to spend I think 5% of whatever income comes in on splurges. And that's stuff that makes me uncomfortable. That's like, yeah, renting the Tesla or doing the coffee course or things that I, I consider 
frivolous, which I should reframe as fun, but I should even, I, I should even rename the splurge and just say fun. Cause you're right. Splurge has a, a negative connotation as well. So, so yeah, it's, it, again, it's just trying to get out of these old habits and they're so hard to get out of cause you're, I'm 42 years old and I've been saying probably these words since I was 10 or whenever I started getting into money. So, so you're absolutely right. It should be fun fund and these are fun expenses and yeah, I should. And then that, and that plays back to the guilt thing. It's like balancing what Ramit's telling me and like using my money to in, improve our lives and have memories that I'm going to cherish for the rest of my life. But then it's also like the guilt of like, well, there's so many people that don't have anywhere near that. And here I am just blowing X amount on this fancy car for a week or whatever. So yeah, it's, it's that balance, which again, as I mentioned before, I don't have, I don't have the answers to, I'm just yeah, trying to work, work through those, all these complex human feelings and yeah, Phi doesn't cure those. <laughs> I talk a big game, but I also have the same limitations. <laughs> Do you still have that Pardon. spreadsheet that you sent me with the <laughs> actual ridiculous amount of itemization and explanation? Like you would buy like a $3 I don't know, Snickers bar or something. And then you would annotate that it was $3 at groceries. But then in the notes, you'd be like, this was a Snickers bar. Probably shouldn't have bought it, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> and I'm like, do you still have that level of tracking detail at this stage of your life? We do not. And that was part like public experiment for bigger pockets, money listeners. Hey, look how hard it is to budget and to mm. get your budget accurate. But even just being conscious about where it's going is like a win. Yeah. Well, and at this stage, I would say it's not a win. So I've, I've taken, I've, so I just track how much we spend rather than categorize it. Cause I found that that was influencing my choices when I saw that like, Oh, this is going to make my restaurant budget go over what it normally is. Then I would probably limit my restaurant eating at the end of the month. And so I, I've done away completely with actual like categorization because I didn't want it to, limit my spending in any way. Cool. I'll get philosophical here for a second and then we'll wrap it up. I'd like to talk about happiness. There's a movie called Soul and I just rewatched this yesterday on a flight. Have you ever seen that movie, Brandon? Or No. Okay. I don't know if I should spoil it for you then. Maybe this whole segment <laughs> is... Uh... <laughs> is it a uh, cartoon? Yes. It is a cartoon, but it's very well done. And I guess I think about this. You should watch it sometime, but in my life... Go ahead. You can, you can share it. You, don't, you can spoil it because I, I don't remember endings to movies, even that I've, movies I've seen. So then it's always <laughs> new to me every time I watch it again. So go ahead. It's, it's super good. If you do watch it, I'd like to hear your opinion on it. But the basic gist of it is, in the movie, this guy has one thing he really wants to accomplish. He wants to be this successful jazz musician and play this show with a famous person and he gets to it and he's like, wow, is this all there is? Like, that was great, but like, like what's next? And then it sounds a little bit cliche, but they frame it really well in the movie. What he comes to is it's not these big goals, it's realizing the, the magic and these little things that happen in day-to-day -day life. And if you can force yourself to have gratitude and pay attention to that stuff, and these novel experiences, maybe that's where it all comes from. And I think of that with my own life, because if I were to ponder what my adulthood would be like as a kid, I never would have thought my life would turn out anywhere near as great as it is right now. Like my life has already sur surpassed all my expectations, and I hope I still have a lot of quality years left. And it's pretty weird. It's like the, the dog that catches the car. Okay, I, I didn't expect that. So what happens now? What do I do with this thing? And I think for me, at least... The real fun is working backwards. Okay, I've got it. Now, what is the real key to happiness? And it, it's not easy, right? Because if it was, someone would write three paragraphs about it. We'd all read it and we'd all be happy. It's different for everyone. But I do think there are some fundamental consistencies between people like getting enough sleep and having these novel experiences and just seeing the, the beauty of everyday life, trying not to be cynical and angry like me i get mad at people too brandon not at ladies when i curl but <laughs> but at other things and i try to turn my thoughts around so i'll end it there this is i'm a work in progress i still have lots of work to do but that's what i've come to at least at this uh narrow point in my life i couldn't agree more and it, it's crazy i'll need to watch that because it, it's only a realization i've had over the last couple of years because before before my son arrived 
like I had, I had lots of big goals. I wanted to, I wanted to go back to grad school and I did that when I was working. I wanted to reach Phi and I did that, you know, six, seven years ago, whatever. The last like big goal I had was to write and release an album, which during the pandemic, I thankfully had all the time in the world to do that because I was post Phi, so I wasn't working at all. And it was pre-kids, so I had just, we were locked inside for 23 hours a day. So I was thankfully able to do that. And it was right before my son arrived and, you know, I was, uh, it's, this is going to sound like really depressive or really like, I don't know, probably not a good thing, but I, I was like 40 and I was like, you know what, you know, all my life I've been fearful of like coming down with a, you know, terminal disease or something. But then at 40, I was like, you know what, I, I feel like I've done so much that even if that happened, I'd be, I'd be maybe not okay with it, but I, I wouldn't be like devastated because like I've, you know, traveled, we see, we've seen the world, we've tr went, been to amazing places and I've accomplished all these things I wanted to accomplish. But then my son arrived and now it's amazing. I get to see everything through his eyes. So all those, like those things you're saying, just like appreciating the, the, the joys of daily life, I'm seeing the world in a whole new way. And it's like, I get to see it through his eyes. And now I just want to yeah, live till I'm 140 and just live it all up again and just see him develop and see like his joy and all the things that I just walk right by these days. So it was a weird, it was a really great, great transition because like I said, I don't think that was a healthy, even though I felt sort of healthy at the time, like, oh, that's a healthy outlook. Like, okay, you've, you feel like you've done everything or you've done enough on this planet to that, you know, if you, if you had to leave it, you'd be okay with it. it I don't think that is a good, <laughs> a really good outlook. And I feel a lot more happy now where I'm at and like, yeah, just so excited to take him and show him everything that I've like loved over the past 42 years. So yeah, I'll have to watch soul because it sounds like exactly the, the realization I've come to over the last you know, two or three years since, since accomplishing that big final thing that I wanted to accomplish and then entering into fatherhood, it sounds like the exact, <laughs> the exact realizations I've had. So I will watch soul. And if it's a cartoon, I'll watch it with Oliver and see what he thinks of it. So Brandon, we've had a lot of this talk about money and how to effectively spend for happiness. It's so interesting because we've known each other for 10, 11 years now, and we've both come a long way from <laughs> drinking water from the spigot at the fondue <laughs> restaurant <laughs> to, to us spending an inordinate amount of time on the city bus to save like 15 bucks on an Uber. I'm glad. I'm glad it seems like we're, we're different people. If you met someone who's early on the journey, that's maybe you see a reflection of your younger self. They're over-optimizing their money like we did. Is there any advice you would give them for how to reconcile this whole path to FI and wanting to be there and save money and still use money effectively, but not being as frugal as we have to sometimes. Yeah, absolutely. First, I would say read Die With Zero because the only regrets I have on my FI journey are sort of missing out on like a few bachelor parties because I was living in Scotland and the weddings were like the month after the bachelor party. And I'm like, I'm not going to fly back to the fly back to the States for a bachelor party and then the wedding. I'll just I'll just do the the wedding. And, you know, those are times in my 20s I can't get back because I'm there's no way I'd want to get that time back. I, there's no way I'd want to do that now is go get absolutely wasted with my idiot friends and do ridiculous things. But I do regret that I don't have those memories, those same memories that my friends do because they were there and I wasn't. So that's really the only regret I have sort of on my FI journey. So I would read Dive with Zero because he frames that in a good way of like, yeah, there there is a time for bachelor parties and it's in your 20s. So yeah, even though you could save up in your 20s and have three bachelor party trips in your forties, the, the bachelor parties aren't going to happen and you're going to be at a whole different stage of your life and you're not going to want to, you're going to, you wouldn't enjoy them anyway. So one bachelor party in your twenties is worth way more than four in your forties or whatever it could be. So that's really important, I think. And then also just try to get good at spending because it is a skill that we're both trying to learn. All three of us are trying to learn and it's a skill that you get better as, as you practice. So I think yeah, it's important to save. Obviously, that's hugely important. I'm so glad that I did. I'm not regretting any of that, really. But I should have been thinking more about how I will spend my money one day because you do want to spend it one day. It's not just for saving and amassing and then just dying with a huge uh, bank account. 
And you do want to try to spend it and give it away and all these other things that you eventually are going to want to do. So it's practicing all of that while you're saving. And yeah, just not definitely not getting into the deprivation zone that I was in during the height of my FI craziness, but also like, yeah, relaxing a little bit, learning how to spend and then spending on those important things that you can't later spend on like those bachelor parties that I talked about. So I think a combination of that is what I would say to myself in my twenties. One thing that's really been helpful for us with our like learning how to exercise our spending muscle is kind of thinking about two different things. What makes you happy and like, what do you enjoy? Like for you, it's coffee and, you know, a multitude of other things, but like the coffee example. And also what do you hate? We hate cleaning. Like we don't live in a dump, but we live in an untidy house and we hate cleaning. And we were having a conversation with Waffles on Wednesday about like after this Ramit episode came out and Mrs. Wow said, you know, one thing that Mr. Wow said to me when we moved was what is something that we can add to our lives or subtract from our lives that would make you happy? And she said, I would like a house cleaner. And I know that house cleaners exist, but it's this disconnect between I could do it myself. So why would I hire somebody? Versus I really hate cleaning my house. It's just like most of our fights have been surrounded by the house not being as clean as the other person wants it to be. So take this pain point out. And it's really not that expensive when you, it's not expensive at all when you have money, but it's, it's not that expensive on your FI journey to hire a cleaner every other week or even once a month if that just gets your house clean and relieves this huge pain point. So, you know, to those listening who are saying, you know, I totally identify with this issue. And that was one of the biggest comments that we got from the show was just people inundating our text messages and emails and just saying, I totally agree with you. I have this problem too. Thank you so much for doing this episode so that I can start to think, you know, reframe it for people like that. Just start thinking about what truly makes you happy and what truly you hate and start removing the things you hate and adding in a little bit more about what makes you happy. She said like, she's actually doing this herself. (laughs) (laughs) That's a great point. And that's going to be my big takeaway from this actually, because I, I don't know what year it was, but maybe 2014 or something. I wrote a post called happiness through subtraction and it, you're absolutely right. It's so much easier to know what you hate and take that away to increase your happiness than it is to add things that you think you want to increase your happiness. Cause we're humans are terrible at actually knowing what we actually want, but we definitely know what we hate. Um, so it's much easier to increase happiness through subtraction than it is through addition. And that's something I haven't even considered on this whole new jer- journey. It's always been about what can I add? What can I 10 X ever since I've been talking to Ramit and I haven't considered what we could take away. So that's going to, that's going to be my big takeaway from this conversation actually, because that's something I haven't done since that 2014 article I wrote happiness through subtraction, but that's a great, great call because I'm sure there's a lot of things that we could take out little things that could maybe add a big boost. So yeah, thank you for bringing that up. And yeah, I couldn't agree more. That's a, that's a, that's a fantastic way to increase happiness. And that's a much more reliable way than trying to add stuff. Cool. Yeah. And we will link to that article in our show notes for this episode. So check that article out for sure. Or like Google it if you don't go to our show notes, which you should, because they're awesome. (laughs) And hopefully it's still up. I haven't seen it in probably eight years. So hopefully it's there and it's not too terrible. It was an earlier one. So we'll see how it is. So Brandon, I almost hesitate to ask you this because I don't think it needs asking, but where can people find you? madfintus.com yeah if you if you go to madfintus.com slash advice i put a pdf together of all your great advice because you guys have been on the podcast loads of times and every episode i finish with what's one piece of advice you give to somebody on the path to financial independence so i put a pdf together so you can get that at madfintus.com slash advice the podcast is wherever you get podcasts and the music stuff, which is the really the only thing I care about uh, these days that I want you to go see. I think if you go to mattfintus.com slash album, 
there's links to Spotify and stuff there. And I try to keep those two projects separate. So that's why there's, I'm not just like blatantly telling you the name of the project, but that's the really, the only thing I care about is uh, Spotify follows. <laughs> so, so go follow me on Spotify. And uh, yeah, I think that's everywhere. Mad Fientist, it's a made up word. So any, anywhere you find Mad Fientist, that's, uh, that's probably me. So, but yeah, thanks for having me on the show. Always great to chat to you guys. And uh, yeah, it's been a while and you guys are the most uh, frequented guests on my podcast. So there's loads of, of, of good Carl and Mindy content on Mad Fientist too. So, so yeah, thanks for having me and hopefully see you in real life soon. Cool. Thank you so much. Yeah, we are always excited to talk to you. Thank you for your time today. I know that you are busy. I remember having a 20 month old and like just running around with my head cut off. It's so big. And it doesn't even seem that busy. And you're all of a sudden you're like, wow, it's five o'clock on Thursday. When was the last time I showered? <laughs> I know exactly. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, thank you for making me shower. Yeah, you're welcome. And Jill, <laughs> you're welcome too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Awesome. Brandon, thank you so much. We'll talk to you soon. Thanks guys. Bye. We, we usually have a pretty extensive blooper reel because of uh, moments like right now. <laughs> because of Carl. Yeah. I'm perfect. Because of me. Mindy is the truth. Nice. Okay. Now we're going to do the outro. Yeah. So the outro is, okay, that was the mad scientist. He is always a delight to talk to. I could just listen to him read the phone book, frankly. He's got such a great voice, but he also has so many interesting things to say. So I uh, thank you, Brandon, for joining us today. It's always super awesome to talk to you. I really loved that interview. I loved how he used the FI movement and the lessons to become financially independent. And now he's focused on his music and his 20 month year old child. How cool is that? That's exactly what this should be about. He he is doing life right. You said 20 month year old, 20 uh, month old, 20 month old. Okay. <laughs> but yeah, check out his music. It's super awesome. Is this the blooper reel? Not well, everything's a blooper reel. This whole episode's a blooper reel. <laughs> Uh, not Brandon's part, just our part. Yeah, my part specifically. <laughs> okay, on next week's episode, we are going to talk about the Phi journey and specifically getting through the boring middle. Ooh, that's going to be a good one. That's a popular question. And I actually think it's the wrong question, but I won't spoil the episode. I've discovered financial independence. Why am I not fi yet? Well, because it takes a little bit of time. And that middle part between discovering it and reaching it is what we call the boring middle. So we are going to talk about that next week. In the meantime, we have a Facebook group for you to join if you would like. It is facebook.com slash groups slash Mindy on Money. And we would love to hear your thoughts on what Brandon had to say today or, frankly, your thoughts on anything. Cool. All right. And that is the end of our show. Thank you so much for listening. So back, back to that Uber. Do you remember that? We were in New Orleans and it was uh, probably only a 10 or 15 minute ride, maybe even less than that with an Uber. But we took the public bus, which made like 15,182 stops. And it took us a very long time to get there. And we did that to save like 15 bucks, right? We didn't even save 15 bucks. This was back when Uber was subsidizing all the rides. We saved like $3. Oh, geez. That's not even the only time we've done that. Remember when we were we had a big layover in uh, Honolulu? And instead of taking, I don't know that they had ride shares back then, but they had taxis. Instead of taking a taxi from the airport in Honolulu to Waikiki, which is where we wanted to go, we sat on the city bus. It's so silly if you think about it, because back to the back to the New Orleans trip, we were there for a conference. We had all these friends we were super excited to meet and talk to. So we took an hour, hour and a half out of time. We could be spending with friends to save like 10 bucks, and that's wrong. And same thing with Hawaii. We could have been on Waikiki Beach, but instead we sat in the bus and looked out the window. What's worse about the New Orleans Uber trip is we could have shared that with other people and reduced our cost from like $3 to like a dollar. But instead, we sat on the bus. So at least we know how to use the New Orleans city bus now, which will never, ever, ever come up again in our lives. I'll be clear. I'm a fan of public transportation, but in those two instances, we should have done something else. Yes. Public transportation is awesome, but also... Your time is valuable.
We could have ran there faster or walked there faster in both cases. I no, think. I don't run. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Anything else you want to say? I think that's it. Are you looking forward to going to Scotland maybe in 2025? I am, but I'm going to bring sunblock this time. Yeah, we should. If you do that, though, it'll rain the whole time. So maybe don't bring it. So, But you can't buy out. it there. Like it never said, it's never sunny there. Yeah. What could we do? I don't know. Maybe we'll ship it ahead of time. Yeah, but then the karma will know and it'll be rainy the whole time because karma will know the sunblock is there. Truth. It's okay. a dilemma. Should we bring the bull to Scotland? No, you can't bring that on the plane. Why not? That could be a weapon. It could. The bull is nice. If it's you watch- heavy and it's got these pokey parts. If I whacked you on the head with this, I could cause serious damage, maybe even death. Wow, it sounds like you're thinking about it. Oh, well, you know. If you're not, watch this on YouTube. We have this little bull sculpture that we bought at the bull on Wall Street or close to Wall Street. So, yeah, it's nice. I, mean, I, I probably won't use it as a weapon against you. I hope not. That would be bad. And now there's evidence you're on YouTube to our millions of viewers. It slipped. Millions of potential viewers. <laughs> We're not quite there yet. But... Okay, bye. Bye. It, wait, it slipped? It bull slipped? That's no bull slip. <laughs> I'm done. <laughs> <laughs>